back, I talked about uh, having a, I don't know what you would call it, seeing a picture of Jesus, having a vision of Jesus during my quiet time. and uh, I don't know that that's happened more than twice in my life. But uh, we were on a, a, a lake. It was golden with what looked like the sunset. And Jesus just smiled. He, he was happy to see me like you would be happy to see an old friend that you hadn't seen for years. And his uh, face was only kindness and, and love. There was no judgment. There was no what have you done? There was none of that. It was just welcoming and kind. And that's his heart for each one of you. We get concerned about, well, have I done this right? Have I done that wrong? You know, what should I do next? But his heart towards you is kindness <coughs> and love. joy in getting to see you and spend time with you. We see that in some of the scriptures when Jesus is, is teaching and, and Mary's at his feet learning and Martha's in the kitchen and says, Lord, tell my sister to help me in the kitchen. We got all these responsibilities. We got to cook for 12 disciples and some of them are hungry. Peter eats enough for two, you know. <laughs> And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're worried about so many things, but only a few are important, really only one. Mary has chosen what is good, and it will not be taken away from her. So Jesus invites you to come into his presence, to enjoy fellowship with him, friendship with him. That's his heart. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you love us so much. We thank you that you take joy in us the way we take joy in a favorite friend that we've not seen for too long. I ask that you would reveal yourself to all of us in that way, that we would see your heart for us because that changes us. Your word says that it's your kindness that leads us to repent. I ask that we would experience your kindness. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you're just joining us online, welcome to Abundant Life Church. I'm Chad Ripley, the pastor here. We're glad that you're with us. Today, we're talking about marriage, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> and we'll explain the title, that if you're not married... There's still a lot to learn here about communication with your friends, with the people that you meet, and how to make that better instead of horrific, <laughs> like the screen. So what does the Bible have to say about marriage? Well, let's take a look. Genesis 2.18 says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper fit for him. <laughs> Proverbs 18.22 says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Well, that sounds wonderful. Where do I find one of those? Proverbs 12.4 says, An excellent wife is the crown of her husband. Well, that sounds good, too. Sign me up. But wait a minute. What's the rest of that verse say? But she who shames him is like rottenness in his bones. Oh, that doesn't sound good at all. I don't want any rottenness in my bones. It sounds like marriage with love can be wonderful. And without it, it can be hellish. If you're in hell, how do you get out? Like Rodney Acton saying, if you're going through hell, keep on going. 
don't, don't stay. What else does the Bible have to say about it? Colossians 3.19 says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Ephesians 5.33 says, Each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. And then 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. Love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. For God is love. I guess the Bible says a lot. Marriage can be wonderful. Marriage can be awful. It goes much better if we love each other. Much smoother we respect each other but how do we do that what are the nuts and bolts of that and maybe there's another question we should ask before we really get started and that's this pastor chad why should i listen to anything you have to say about this subject about marriage you failed you've been divorced why should we listen to you well I asked my dad some of those same questions when he was still with us. I said, Dad, why would they even want me to be their pastor? I've been divorced. Doesn't that disqualify me? What could I possibly tell them about marriage? And Dad said, well, son, I think you're selling yourself short. You've studied marriage more than anybody I know. You have a lot to say about it. Well, he had a point. I have studied marriage extensively. Why? Well, what teaches you more in life? Success or failure? Failure. I've failed. So I've studied marriage with an earnestness that most have not. But I understand the counterpoint, too. Dave Ramsey says, don't ask a broke man how to be a millionaire. Right? <laughs> so I get that. So I've studied marriage from experts in the field. Folks who have a proven track record of a good marriage themselves and the ability to teach other couples to succeed as well. My friend Mike and his wife Dawn have a ministry helping couples change their communication patterns so that it changes their marriage, so that their marriage can be successful, they can be enjoyable, they can be fulfilling. Maybe we should turn this one off. They teach across the country as part of the Gottman Institute, founded by John Gottman and his wife, Julia Schwartz Gottman, both psychologists, and I studied some of Gottman's work for this message. So you get the best of both worlds. You can benefit from my failure. And you can learn from people who were far more successful than me. But back to our original question. How do we love each other? How do we respect each other? The Bible says to do it, but what are the nuts and bolts of that? What if I could tell you within 15 minutes of meeting you and your spouse if your marriage is going to end in divorce? Well, John Gottman conducted a study that did just that with over 90% accuracy. He began what was nicknamed the love lab. It was an apartment where couples were studied as they interacted with each other and they were really observed. Their heart rate was measured. Their palm sweat was measured. They had chairs that they called fidgety chairs because they could tell if you were fidgeting <laughs> when they asked your spouse a question and you turned to her. And then they had the video to see what you did. Was there any eye rolling, looking the other way? And experts would pick apart the video. 15 minutes and they could say, you know what, those, those folks are getting divorced. They came up with some behaviors that were so destructive to the relationship that they called them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Let's take a look. We'll run the video. And maybe we'll kill this light. You're so selfish. 
Ugh, what an idiot. It's not my fault we're always late. Forget it. Criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. Dr. John Gottman calls these negative communication patterns the four horsemen of the apocalypse because they'll lead to the end of your relationship. In fact, he can predict this relationship failure with over 90% accuracy if the behavior isn't changed. So, what can you do? Well, at the Gottman Institute, we understand you might not even know you're communicating this way, or you might not know how to control it. But if you practice the following four research-based antidotes, there is hope for your future. Criticism attacks the character of the recipient instead of focusing on a specific behavior. The antidote to criticism is to talk about your feelings using I statements, then express a positive need. Contempt is an expression of superiority that comes out as sarcasm, cynicism, name-calling, eye-rolling, sneering, mockery, and hostile humor. Contempt is the greatest predictor of relationship failure and must be eliminated. The antidote to contempt is to treat one another with respect and build a culture of appreciation within the relationship. Defensiveness is self-protection through righteous indignation or playing the victim. Defensiveness never solves the problem and is really just an underhanded way of blaming your partner. The antidote to defensiveness is to accept responsibility, even if only for part of the conflict. Stonewalling occurs when the listener withdraws from the conversation without resolving anything. It takes time for the negativity created by the first three horsemen to result in stonewalling. But when it does, it can become a habit. The antidote to stonewalling is to break for at least 20 minutes, calm down, then return to the conversation. Spare your relationship from certain destruction. Learn more about eliminating the four horsemen by visiting our site. We'll talk about each of those behaviors so you can see if you recognize any of them in your communication. The first horseman is criticism. Hey, Freeman, I'm kind of in the middle of a message now. I know, but I just think that using a video instead of preparing everything yourself like a good pastor is kind of lazy. Wow. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm sorry that you think it's... And not only that, I mean, look at... I'm sorry, but your shirt just looks terrible. Did you even try to iron it this morning? I, I, I didn't iron it, no. And I mean, like, most most pastors I see on TV, like, they tuck it in, you know, like... And, and is, this, is this you trying to be cool and hip and appeal to the younger crowd or something? Because the younger crowd is everybody, like, younger than you. <laughs> everybody. That's that's a lot of people, Freeman. You know what? You're, you're home. I... Now, I like Freeman, but how long do you think our friendship would last if he spoke to me like that every Sunday? <laughs> Criticism hurts. Criticism attacks the person, not the behavior. Well, what's the behavior? I used a video for my message. Now, you can like that or not, but it's only a behavior. But Freeman said that I was lazy. That's attacking character, not just screen with the behavior. And sometimes in marriage, there's going to be a complaint. I really don't think you can live with anybody without a complaint coming up. There's times I'm not happy with Lexi the Labradoodle. <laughs> there's times she wished I would have let her in sooner. Even, even in a relationship like that, there can be a legitimate complaint. But there's a difference between a complaint, which is going to happen, and a criticism. Gottman gave this example for a complaint. I was scared when you were running late and you didn't call me. I thought that we had agreed that we were going to do that for each other. Listen to how that complaint contrasts with a criticism. You never think about how your behavior is going to affect other people. I don't believe you're that forgetful. You're just selfish. You never think about others, and you never think about me. How different does that sound? Now, Gottman calls the first one a, a gentle startup. Notice the I statements. I was scared. I thought we'd agreed to do this. I statements 
lets you take responsibility for your own feelings. They're not blaming somebody else. Now look at the criticism. You never think about your behavior. You are selfish. You're not forgetful. You just don't think of others. You don't think of me. A lot of you statements, and you statements come across as blaming, as accusatory. Complaints can be addressed, but criticisms feel like an attack. Being criticized is exhausting. It, it wears you out. It didn't take long, even, even pretending, and I had to ask Freeman to do that. He did not want to come criticize me, although he did a fantastic job. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they did a fantastic job. I, I wrote out that horribly criticizing script for him. <laughs> but even in that example, it doesn't take long before you oh, man, I, I don't know. I don't, you, you feel bad quickly when you're being criticized, don't you? You shrink up. So don't attack your partner. Learn to express a complaint without a criticism, without criticizing some character flaw in your spouse. The second horseman is contempt, and it's by far the deadliest one. One feeds into the other. If you criticize your spouse, if you're saying, you know what, you did this because you're lazy, you did this because you're selfish, you did this because you don't think of others, you criticize them, then you're not looking at the behavior, you're attacking their character. You're saying you have this character flaw, that's why you did this. And if you continue to do that, soon you're going to have a list of character flaws about your spouse, right? I don't like this about him, I don't like this about him, I don't like this about him. When you have that list, you begin to despise your partner. And you cannot long live with somebody that you despise. Contempt comes through with sarcasm, hostile humor, mocking, eye rolling. Has everybody seen an eye roll? Can we practice it? Here we go. Now, if everybody practiced it, you can eliminate that from your repertoire. It does no good whatsoever, ever. It, it, it is offensive. Those behaviors can make your partner feel despised and worthless. Nobody wants to feel that way. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says we take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. And when you have a negative thought about your spouse, when you've discovered a character flaw that you want to think about, that is a fine time to take those thoughts captive to Jesus. Your relationship simply will not survive contempt. It has to be rooted out. The way to do that is with appreciation. Say thank you when your spouse does something that you appreciate. Uh, when I was in Minnesota, I would thank my uncle for building a fire. I would thank him for making his snowmobiles available and, and getting them ready to go. I'd thank him for letting me use his equipment. He would thank me for shoveling snow, for taking out the trash. We would both thank Aunt Jeanette for making breakfast. Simple things, but you end up having an atmosphere of saying thank you for doing that. You're not taking it for granted. Thank you for doing that for me. I appreciate that. And when you develop that kind of attitude, that uh, some people will call it the attitude of gratitude because it rhymes. If we have that towards the Lord, we feel pretty good about life. If we spend some time thanking him for a beautiful day, right? If we have that attitude about our spouse, we begin to appreciate them. And in most relationships, we've seen that it takes five positive interactions for every negative one if you're going to thrive, right? Negative, for some reason, sticks out in our mind, doesn't it? One, you know, what happens in your day? You have one or two bad things happen in your day, and what do you say? Oh, Pastor, I had a bad 30 seconds. 
It was horrible. That's not what we say, is it? What do we say? I had a bad day. Did you? Well, let me tell you about my day yesterday. I, I got up, had a nice cup of coffee, sat on the couch, petted Lexi the Labradoodle, had a nice breakfast of avocado toast with the egg on it. Later, I went to a friend's retirement party from the police department, got to see old friends and eat their snacks and drink their drinks. And then I went to Walmart looking for some new clothes. <laughs> <laughs> got back home I thought you know what I, I should go to the mailbox and you know get my mail and so I do that and it's dark and I live out in the country and a place where they have the mailboxes it's pitch dark but they have automatic lights so when you step on to uh, the porch there the lights turn on there's a walkway going up and uh, it doesn't turn on until you're off the walkway and, and on the the porch. Well, <coughs> turned out I walked off the walkway, hit something, fell flat on my face, and then the lights came on. Dink! <laughs> so that the six guys playing basketball next to the <laughs> mailboxes could see that. Well, I was very tempted to think I had a bad day. But what I had was a bad five seconds, right? It's the same thing in our relationships. You say one negative thing to your spouse, and it's going to take five positives just to bring you back to even. So how do you get all those positives? Well, start saying some thank yous. Thank you for making breakfast. Thank you for taking out the trash. Not, you know, hey, it's your job to take out the trash and it's starting to overflow. The, I saw you push it down twice. Why don't you get it out? You know? <laughs> Instead of that, when they take it out and you say nothing because, hey, it's his job to take out the trash or it's her job to cut the lawn, thank you for it. It doesn't hurt your day to have a few more thank yous in it. It, it feels good not only for the person that you're thanking, it helps develop an attitude in yourself of thankfulness, of gratefulness. Lord, thank you that there's somebody here that takes out my trash for me because I don't like doing that and I'm glad that it's gone. It's like magic. You know? The third horseman is defensiveness. And that's often a response to criticism. You see how these things, they feed on each other. One brings another and that one brings the worst one. And that one brings another. If, if I get defensive, I escalate the disagreement. You know, when, when Freeman said you're lazy, you're, what are you talking about lazy? Lots of preachers use videos in their sermons. If you think it's so easy, why don't you preach a sermon next Sunday? <laughs> well, that's not going to go over well, is it? That's going to escalate. It. What's a, a better response? I'm sorry you don't like an idea of the video in, in the sermon, and I hope I'm not lazy, but I, I do have to admit it's much easier to press play and sit and watch than it is to stand up here and talk to y'all. So I, that's true. But as I was debating of whether or not to use that video, I, I thought it would be helpful for us, so I decided to use it. Okay, that's a better response. That's not defensive. When you feel defensive, slow down a little bit. Listen to understand instead of respond. Try and understand your partner's point of view. See it from their side. Proverbs 15.1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath. Another translation says a gentle answer. But a harsh word stirs up anger. So answer softly. Answer gently. The fourth horseman is stonewalling. And stonewalling can be a response to contempt. Again, these things feed on each other. Stonewalling occurs when the listener withdraws from the interaction, shuts down, and simply stops responding to their partner. It looks like this. Now, Freeman, is it okay if I show one more video? Okay, just one. Last one, I promise. Okay, Rachel, well, let's roll it. Excuse me. Uh, 
I think we'll have to go forward a couple slides. So we'll hit enter one more time if, if it starts to start and it will go to the next slide. There we go. Excuse me. There's a sign at Rampsit Park that says do not drink the sprinkler water. So I made some tea with it and now I have an infection. Sir? Sir, are, 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 are you listening to me, sir? Sir, I'm talking to you. Sir? Sir, are you aware that there is waste in your water system? <laughs> that's, that's stonewalling. You recognize that? It's when you're having one of those conversations with your spouse and it looks like this. She's facing the other way looking at you like this. That's stonewalling. When does that happen? Well, when your emotions begin to physiologically flood you, right? You get to a point where I, I really can't be helpful. I really can't discuss this anymore. Uh, I'm angry or I'm hurt. Uh, I'm overwhelmed with emotion and it's starting to take effect on my physical body, right? I'm f flooded with emotion. And so I, I shut down. Well, what's the solution to that? It's being honest about those feelings and, and taking a 20-minute break. Saying, you know what, I'm, I'm so angry right now. I, I can't have a conversation well. I really need a break. Can we meet back in 20 minutes and, and continue our discussion? You ask for a break, and that does a couple things. It, first of all, it, it's humbling right, instead of saying, oh, I can't talk about this right now. Well, that's escalating. Honey, I, this, I'm really flooded. I, I'm, I'm really angry. I, I need a break. May I have a break and we can come back and talk about this in 20 minutes? Sure, have a break. And so then you go take one. You, you, you take a walk or you read or you play guitar or you, whatever you do that is soothing to you. 20 minutes will let those emotions calm down. And frankly, you're probably letting your spouse calm down too, right? They may not be the one that took the break, but they probably need a little time as well. Then when you come back, your emotions have settled and you can talk about it again without just that flood of emotions. Those are the four horsemen of the apocalypse in marriage. Criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. If you recognize any of those patterns in your communication, in your relationship, it's time to root them out and replace them with a gentle start, with appreciation, understanding your partner's perspective, taking responsibility for your own, and asking for a break when your emotions are flooded. Marriage takes more than the right person. It takes more than being a Christian. Marriage takes more than love. Marriage takes skills, and skills can be learned. Let's learn them together. Amen. Amen. I love that video from Parks and Recreation <laughs> on, on stonewalling. <laughs> it just illustrates so perfectly how we sometimes feel. <laughs> la, 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 I can't hear you. <laughs> Are there any comments or insights on marriage and the four horsemen? Yes, Patty. So you have to use terms of engagement. Let's take that break. You know, it, it really, um, I, just a testimony, sometimes in our, Gerald and I, I'll just say, sweetheart, 
let's just take it easier. You know, just using that terms of endurement will, will even, you know, calm it down a little bit. Yes. Uh, you know, names should be that. Yeah. Uh, my grandparents called each other sweethearts into their 80s. Uh, it, was, it was really nice, and it, and it diffuses things. So if you're going to call him a name, it better be handsome, you know. <laughs> you're going to call her a name, it better be, hey, gorgeous, can we just take a break? You know, none, no idiots, no stupids, no. Name calling is just so hurtful that you have to root it out. And those terms of endearment can help. You know. What are you doing? Yes, my beloved? You, you know, it's... It, <laughs> Calm things down. Frederick. Father, for giving us some uh, laughter and sense of humor. I mean, these last five minutes or so, you know, we've just displayed how, what a release it is to laugh. And I just think that that's a great uh, opportunity to maybe diffuse the situation sometimes to tell a lighthearted joke or maybe find something funny in the situation. Yes, they say you got to laugh or else you'll cry <laughs> sometimes, and you're right. Laughter is something that God's given us, and, and humor is a good way to talk about serious subjects, right? That's, a, that's good insight. Woody, are you going to get on me because I said magic? Man, I, I don't know about these videos, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> you no, and Freeman can start a club. <laughs> yeah, we, oh, that's my brother, okay. <laughs> I, I just find, you know, just change my attitude and thanking and giving him praise. And I, I see my caregiver come in sometimes and just seem like she's down and out or something like that. And what do you want? What would you like for breakfast? I said, well, you know, I thought about pancakes and eggs. Let's just have eggs or something like that. And I thank her. And then, and usually, you know, you know, just chit chatting with her a little bit and trying to, you know, give her encouragement and, you know, what the Lord does for me or whatever, but I think just saying thank you, just yeah. like you're saying, just, it matters a lot, and, you know, by the time she's leaving, she's smiling, and, you know, I said, have a blessed day, be careful out there, thank you, and, I mean, like this morning, she wound up making some chicken for me for tonight, and I thought I was going to have a sandwich, you know, and thank you, thank you for going, man, I really appreciate that, and it does, it matters a lot, and you can just see, see it in whether it's your partner, friend, or whoever, you just see the change and how it, how it does lift them up, you know. It does. See, even those of us, uh, I'm wired a bit this way. I like to help. I like to be useful. Um, but afterwards, it means a whole lot to me if you say, hey, thank you. All right? It means a whole lot. Yes? I just uh, thank you, uh, Pastor, for uh, identifying these four characteristics of, you know, having a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I, <clears throat> I just thank God right now because the spiritual application that I see, right, in this is we've all fallen short of the glory, right? And so what do we have? We have grace. But also I think one of the keys for me is repentance, sure. right? You know, we repent of name-calling, stonewalling, uh, contemptness and criticism right. and then we're given another opportunity to do it over again perhaps maybe on the good side yeah, and, and re repent <coughs> means to turn around I'm going this way ooh I repent that's a bad way I go back this way so it's more than saying I'm sorry it's changing your behavior and the, the thankfulness it just does so much for you if, because you end up purposely focusing your attention on what your spouse has done that you like. You're purposely, when I say thank you, Frederick, for doing that, Frederick is not my spouse, but say <laughs> thank you, Frederick, for doing that, I am focusing on something good that Frederick did, right? Sometimes I've thanked him uh, for his ministry with with Facebook, with YouTube, with the online presence that we have. I have no idea how people find us, but there's people in other countries, there's people in other states that find us and listen to these messages. And all I can do is preach them. I cannot broadcast them, but Frederick can. So I've said, thank you, Frederick, for that, right? Well, what do I do when I'm saying thank you? 
I'm concentrating on something good he's done. I'm concentrating on some skills that he has that I appreciate, that I need. What am I not doing? Well, does Frederick have any flaws? I don't know, but I bet Anne Marie could tell me, right? <laughs> she, she says maybe one, right? <laughs> if I concentrate on that flaw, you know, if I, if I don't like blue socks, I think, you know what, Frederick wore blue socks. I just don't like that. The way I asked Freeman to, to concentrate on my shirt, right? When you focus on something negative, you see your spouse in a negative light. You see them as flawed instead of, man, I really appreciate that she does this. You think, I really hate it that she has blue socks. You know? <laughs> so that thank you does more. It, it makes a person feel appreciated. Yes, it's important there. But it's important for your heart as well. It's important for your focus so that you're focusing on good things. Because like you said, we need grace. We all fall short. And so if, if, if all you guys do is focus on Chad's flaws, oh my goodness. By the time this week is over and next Sunday has come, I am certain, you know, we could develop a list of Chad's flaws. And if we talk about those every Sunday, I don't give me two months before, you know what, Pastor, um, we hesitate to use that word with you, but we need you to go. <laughs> That's what happens in our hearts when we concentrate on flaws, when we don't concentrate on good characteristics. We married our spouse because of some good things, right? You didn't slip and fall and, and hey, hey, who are you? You know, we, we're married. You picked your spouse for some good reasons. There's some good qualities in them that you saw, that you appreciated. That's why you're married. So if we spend some time focusing on them, more of our time on purpose, looking at the good things, we just don't have as much time to think about the flaws. Anybody else? Bill? You know, when I was working, uh, they had a supervisor's course that they bought. We spent a whole week going over what you just did here in what, about 30 minutes or so. This is such a good program. <laughs> but something I, you know, I was married 56 years, but one of the things that uh, I know Shirley really appreciated when we walked in public, if I held her hand or opened the door for her, Yes. Uh, you know, women especially appreciate that. And another thing is, the right answer is yes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we may we may get into that another time, but there's some studies that have shown probably 70 percent of our disagreements are never resolved. At least not where somebody's going to say, "Hey, you know what." You're right, you, you have changed my mind. Uh, I'm never gonna wear blue socks again. I also don't like them now. <laughs> that almost never happens. So you have to come to a point of being able to disagree with your spouse without um, seeing them as flawed or seeing them as wrong. They're different, not necessarily wrong. There's very few, I mean, you, you think about with people on social media, a lot of us are, are on how many times do you see somebody post something that you disagree with and it, you type a response, how often do they come back with, you know, I've reconsidered my opinion. <laughs> and I have determined that I agree with you and that I too believe I was stupid to say that. <laughs> that it doesn't happen, does it? So why do we expect it? Well, why do we think that a conflict has to be resolved with somebody being right. It does not. It has to be resolved, like Milton said, with us being loved. And how we, how we treat each other, man, you notice that. You know, I, I look at Daniel and Tanya, and, and they're affectionate, right? They, you look at them and you think, oh man, they love each other. And it's a, it's a neat thing, it's a neat testimony appreciate y'all doing that. But it's obvious that things that, like you said, Milton, are you holding hands or not? 
you know, the, the first time you don't hold hands, your spouse is going to notice that, right? Maybe three years later, it's going to get to stonewalling, where, well, we never hold hands, right? So those little things are, they're important. Woody. I was just thinking about, you know, God is love. And what Jesus said to the disciples that love one another as I have loved you, and that's, that goes a long way, you know. I mean, if that's in your heart, and I, and I just try more and more every day, I mean, even though I'm by myself or whatever, I'm Paco, you know, but you know, I might tell him I love him, you know. I just, I love you, Bubba, and I give him a nice pet. But it's just uh, expressing that a lot, I think, that, you know, especially in a relationship is really, uh, is really important. And for the online audience, Paco is Woody's dog. Oh. <laughs> and, and I think I, I think about something also that you know how the, the guy sitting at this table, and, and he says, well, "How come you don't tell your wife you love her?" He says, "I told her that when we got married." <laughs> like, okay, she knows it, but come on, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's not often enough. And here's where we get into problems. We know that the Bible says to love each other. We know that, right? But then how do we do that? What are the nuts and bolts of that? What does that look like? What does that communication look like? Very good. Well, we'll move on to some announcements. Next week is daylight savings time. So set your clocks an hour ahead Saturday night. Our next ladies' brunch and Bible study is going to be Monday, not this Monday, but the next, March 13th, 10.30 a.m. At, at Sharon Ripley's house. There's a sign-up sheet in the back for that so that she knows how much food to prepare. I've heard that that uh, is always quite a spread, quite a feast, but I've never been invited to the ladies' Bible study. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't feel right about it. I'd feel a little weird. <laughs> our ministry to the city's homeless is scheduled for the 19th uh, there is a sign up sheet for that as well uh, for the items needed to make lunches are there uh, and I had one more thing uh, we've had Ryan Pena come and preach several times and some of y'all have given an offering for his ministry and when you've done that we've made sure that it gets to him Many times when we have a guest speaker come, we'll take up a free will offering for him. With Pastor Pena, we're having him come more frequently than that, and so the church is paying him each time he comes, just so that you know that. So you're not wondering, well, you know what, should I give to his ministry so that, you know, Chad doesn't send him out the door penniless, you know, what should I do? If you want to, to give to his ministry and you label it for that, it will absolutely get to him. But so that you know, we are paying him when he comes. Are there any other announcements that we should share? Then let's stand and pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. Amen. After the service, if you would like to have somebody pray with you, you go through this door and immediately to your left we'll have some folks there that would be happy to pray with you. Let's remain standing for our closing hymn.